Uh, welcome to what I hope will be a very exciting memorial lecture for 2023 for the Greenfield um, Chair. Before I introduce our panel, I would like to tell you a little bit about my namesake, um, which I carry with a lot of um, honor and appreciation and the lasting impact of his legacy. So um, every year in preparation for this meeting, I actually go back and read his biography. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about it. You should definitely read the book. Um, so Mr. Greenfield was born in Lithuania and immigrated to the US with his family when he was a child. And growing up in Philly, Mr. Greenfield became a prominent developer, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and political figure. Mr. Greenfield was a strong advocate for civil rights and helped to desegregate many businesses and institutions in Philadelphia. In fact, in the 1930s, he was one of the few businessmen who openly supported the NACP um, and its fight against racial discrimination. Mr. Greenfield also believed in providing opportunities for people of all backgrounds to succeed. He hired and promoted African American employees at a time when many other businesses refused to do so. He was known for providing job training and educational opportunities to employees, regardless of their race or their ethnicity and creating jobs and economic opportunities for people in the city throughout his revitalization of downtown. Indeed, Mr. Greenfield's entrepreneur, entrepreneurial efforts contributed to significant advances in human relations by creating opportunities for people of all backgrounds to succeed, fighting against discrimination, and supporting institutions and organizations that were focused on education and civil rights. It's due to Mr. Greenfield's legacy and example that I have brought this amazing panel together to help us think about the opportunities and challenges in advancing health equity through um, entrepreneurship. So I get to tell you a little bit about our amazing panelists. Uh, Ellie Kaplan is the co-founder and CEO of NeuroTrack, a company that uses AI to assess and track the progression of cognitive decline. She co-founded NeuroTrack in 2012 with the goal of developing a non-invasive and affordable tool for early detection and prevention of Alzheimer's. Under her leadership, NeuroTrack has raised millions of dollars in funding and has formed partnerships with major health organizations and the NIH. Kaplan was recognized as a woman to watch in science and technology. I did not know this, Ellie, uh, but it is definitely true um, <laughs> by the Huffington Post. And uh, I have the distinct pleasure of being one of her classmates through the Aspen Institute of Health Innovation Fellowship. Michael O'Neill is the founder and CEO of GetWell Network a healthcare technology company that provides digital tools and services to improve patient engagement and outcomes to over 700 health organizations in the U.S. and abroad. Michael started the company in 2000, recognizing the need for better communication and engagement between patients, families, and healthcare providers. Michael has been recognized for his contributions to healthcare innovation, including being an Aspen Institute Fellow and a past recipient of the Global Goods Fund Social Entrepreneur of the Year Award and the Georgetown Entrepreneurial Alliance Social Impact Award. Dr. Raina Merchant is a physician, researcher, and friend who focuses on the intersection of healthcare and technology. She is a professor of medicine here at the Perlman School of Medicine, associate vice president of digital health, and chief transformation officer of the University of Pennsylvania Health System. Her work explores the use of social media and mobile technologies to improve healthcare delivery and patient outcomes, particularly in emergency and acute care settings. Dr. Merchant has received numerous grants and awards for her work, she is also an Aspen Institute of Health Innovator Fellow and a member of the National Academy of Medicine. So you are in for quite a treat. And I am going to now sit with our panelists and have a conversation. So join us. So welcome to the three of you. Is, is the mic okay? You're doing it okay? Great. Um, we have been uh, talking a lot about health equity and how to think about partnerships, entrepreneurship. And so I'm gonna kick us off with just a, a, an easy one. What needs to change in society for us to be able to uh, move the needle in health equity? And this is meant to be an informal conversation. So please talk amongst yourself. You know, you're to come in. What gets in the way? I mean, what doesn't? Uh, I think um, you know if you think about how we institutionalize, integrate and incentivize any kind of real change, um, very often there are dollars tied to it. And so I think part of it is um, thinking about how we make a strong business case 
uh, as well as um, a uh, social justice, um, democratic, and other types of cases for really integrating um, ways to make it more mainstream. I think it's hard to get away from the business case, which tends to drive most things for good or bad. Also, um, short-term focus gets in the way, and so it's really easy to um, have something that can seem very over in the moment, and people get excited about it. To really, though, maintain that focus takes um, real commitment and prioritization on the part of, of businesses to identify as this is something that is going to become part of our core set of um, areas where we focus. I also think having individuals who have expertise to really drive the agenda is important and not sort of just one person who's a chief whatever officer, but a way to sort of embed a lens of health equity throughout an entire business is, is really important. You know, I think one of the things that makes um, health equity difficult, particularly in the United States, is any kind of system of change requires multi-stakeholder engagement and our reimbursement system is so complicated that the multiple stakeholders you're trying to pull together actually have different incentives. Um, some of them, of course, um, need to deliver as much care as possible in order to make revenue, while others are actually trying to figure out how to get very preventative in care so people access the system less. And so others are supplying things that actually so they want volume. And so I think like real system change requires um, again, multiple actors coming together and collaborating. And the business model of healthcare in this country makes it very hard for those multiple folks to come together in a sustained way, you know, in, in over a long period of time. I would just add access to that. I mean, I think the reality is that we still don't have broad access to, for everyone, to all different kinds of care. And so, you know, until we can democratize that a bit. I think it makes it really challenging. So we started talking about um, there is a business lens uh, thinking about cost, revenue generation, sustainability, access. So how in your own work have you started thinking through how to make a social justice human relations case for business and health equity? Embedding it in sort of the core mission and values helps to identify for everyone across sort of an organization that this is part of the top priority and not sort of tacked on to the end. And we, you know, believe in health equity, but really sort of um, making that um, uh, really materially evident through the mission and then through the ways in which um, people are can track and measure over time, I think is really important. So having a high level in the mission and vision in a really legible way, and then sort of tying that with clear sort of metrics for how we'll measure how we're doing in this area is important. I, I think about um, working at the bookends, if you will. And I think the one bookend is at the value level. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and if you go to business school, there's this famous saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Mm -hmm. And that is actually true, but values eat at the dinner table. And I think it's like really important that in an organization to drive this change, you go to the core of the values. How do you declare them? How do you actually operate accordingly? How do you actually manage both your board, your teammates, your customers around those values and how you use them as a filter that's unwavering? Now, the other end of the, of the, of the bookend, I think is, are your actual products and services being pointed at work? that can really drive some equity in health. And at our company, um, I'm pushing our organization to stop talking about the platform and the products. And to, those are merely foundations for programs of purpose that can really drive change. And so I think if you operate in both of these um, ends of the bookends, if you will, I think if you don't do them both, it's hard to really drive some of the change that we all know we actually want. I would just add accountability to that. I think, you know, absolutely you have to measure it so you know, you know, what's happening, what's not. And then you've got to make sure that that people, uh, in addition to the institution, are accountable for 
um, ensuring that you actually achieve the, the metrics that um, that you put in place and are, are driving for. You know, one of one of the things that I I think sometimes students, faculty, uh, folks in the community are always thinking about is they get to see the end product, right? So they get to see the bookends, but they don't necessarily know how did you get to those bookends. And I'm wondering if you know if you are three exceptional leaders in the space. If you would be willing to talk an example of how, what had to change for those bookends to be able to actually hold the middle? Yeah, I think it's funny. So we started Get Well Network 23 years ago, and it took us 13 years to get 30 health systems to adopt our patient engagement tools. And then it took us three more to get 400 more. So when you get into healthcare, as all of you know, in nursing and wherever the field is, you're either studying or working. Um, I think, number one, uh, unfortunately, things don't happen overnight. <laughs> so I think, I think like you have to really um, be willing to uh, know that there's going to be a lot of no's before you get a yes in the work you want to do. But I do think that in order to kind of hold that stuff together, um, uh, you need to find uh, people again that actually are have the courage and the strength to fight through so many. It's like pushing a rock up a really steep hill with like wind blowing at your face. And um, but man, when you get through it and you begin to see the outcomes of the work, it is the most energizing thing you can imagine. Um, I won't go on too long, but we have a an internal Slack channel called Patient Love at Get Well Network, and what that really means is we have these community navigators that all day long are sharing stories at the literally at the individual patient level hey i met a new mom on medicaid yesterday in jackson mississippi and she was struggling with this but here's what we actually did for her and so i do think like what's powerful about healthcare is um as scaled as it is it's about one person having a poor or great experience to deliver great care for them so i think it's a great way to hold things together is really kind of make sure you're focused on the end patient if you will you know or consumer and, and design the products for those individuals. I mean, you take a, um, a use case like ours in NeuroTrack where uh, we have developed um, assessment and care management tools for Alzheimer's disease. Historically, if you look at the way people were tested for cognitive decline in Alzheimer's, um, these are pen and paper tests that were designed and normed for a largely well-educated white male population. And Alzheimer's is a disease that disproportionately impacts Black Americans, Hispanic Americans, and women. So we had these tests that, was, that were being used for, um, for largely groups of people who, you know, it wasn't properly measuring them. Um, and so really stepping back and thinking about who are your patients and what do they need and designing it with them. So we, we have, uh, our tests have all been designed to um, remove all that bias, and we've normed them in literally every population in the U.S., and so we know that when we go into a health system, that if someone comes in and, um, and they are Latinx, and they grew up speaking Spanish, and they have a, you know, fifth grade education level, that we can capture um, accurate information on that patient just as accurately as if they are a 55 year old white male college educated. And so I think it's really about stepping back and thinking um, both from a whole health equity perspective, but also just from a business perspective. Who, who are your customers? And customers often don't look like you do. Um, and so really thinking about how you design products for those individuals. The functionality of leadership is also really important in both in terms of leaders and sort of the pipeline of leaders. Um, I didn't develop these programs, but Penn has been really intentional. I was just on a panel with, with Laura about this, but like really being intentional about how you are creating infrastructure to support a diverse leadership that won't bear the burden of caring for all this work, but that can help and be um, help to guide some of the work that will happen in this area. And without the intentionality of it, um, you, it's very easy to not have a diverse um, sort of leadership board or um, employee pool. And so really thinking strategically about how you create mechanisms, programs, um, resources to um, enable 
more diversity of, of leadership and across an organization, I think is, is critically important. So how do you pitch that case for a social justice, health equity lens, right, to your board or to your senior leadership? We can start there and we'll talk about how do you trickle it down to the day-to-day -day, um, workers in, in the company or in a health system. But you, you guys pitch all the time. Like, what's your pitch? I mean, I, I think the pitch is it's critical to any company being successful. Um, it's critical from an employee recruitment and retention perspective. It's critical from a pure business and, and um, getting customers and um, generating revenue perspective. Uh, I think it's critical. I think people want to work where they feel good about what they're doing. And, um, and we know that diverse teams um, you know, are more successful than non-diverse teams. So I think it's about thinking about all the things that impact your business case, customers, uh, employees, um, and, and understanding that, to me, health equity is core and central to all of those things. You can't be successful without it. I think the data is on, our, is on the side of the entrepreneur and business leader to drive their organizations at health equity. And I mean, when I say that, I mean, um, the data is so... Uh, it's so clear that the magnitude of the problem and the magnitude of the cost, because we're not delivering healthcare in an equitable way, is so massive that it makes, I guess, the argument for focusing your resources on great work in this area easy. Uh, so the data actually is on the side of the entrepreneur who wants to run at this, because it's not just the right thing to do, but actually the dollars are massive, you know? Um, and so I think, uh, it's not just because the headlines are hot right now. Like, the data is not changing fast. And so I think there's a real run ahead for the next 10 years, not 10 months, on how to figure out how to point R&D resources, software resources, commercial resources, clinical resources, you know, at things that can make a difference sustainably. So I kind of think we're in a bit of a, a, a golden era of when you care about this stuff. I, mean, I would be saying, go at it like as hard as you possibly can, relentlessly and without apology, because uh, the data is on your side and it's the right thing. I think the more that you point the resources towards the, those areas, you can begin to develop products that are going to specifically um, sort of be directed towards um, health equity, towards social justice, cost savings, opportunities for revenue, but also the brand reputation. It's a real distinguisher for businesses that have figured this out and can actually have that as a real sell for people who are looking at these um, organizations to say that we have this business model, we have the ability to expand our brand reputation because we've really invested here in a meaningful way. But these are hard questions, right? Like it's, if it was so easy, then why wouldn't we see these like incredible shifts in, yeah. in the market where everybody has, you know, sort of this incorporated this into their business it's really you know sort of requires just a lot of like focus from like the very top to get things done it's funny as you say that i remember vividly a conversation at our board so my company is private equity owned and so does a uh, we have a for-profit company that's been around for a long time and then we have a non-profit kind of charity arm does a lot of work in communities across the world and on the for-profit side i remember telling our board um we're we're going to run at some underserved populations. Uh, this was just prior to the pandemic and through the pandemic. And the model is going to change because the AI and the tech alone isn't going to work. These are like real people in neighborhoods and communities that have not been served effectively by healthcare for a long time. So we're actually going to hire uh, virtual but local navigators to augment the AI. When the AI fails, we're going to have people that actually are of the community, in the community, know the communities to kind of pick up where the tech kind of failed. And what it's going to do from a business standpoint is take your margins from 90% gross margins of software down to 60, 50, 60% because you have people doing this work. And so this was one of our board conversations in a very real one to say, um, hey, this is going to change the nature of our business. Um, if we're all like locking arms on our values, well, then it's going to be hard to say no to. The profile of business is going to change, but man, like the work and its importance and its impact um, will be real. 
But these are like real conversations with, you know, boards of directors and investors who have a lot at stake themselves as well. But again, I would go back to saying, um, if there were ever a time to lean into the kind of work that you want to do as an entrepreneur, um, this would be it. So how do you start? So we have some very young entrepreneurs, both on Zoom, hello, um, but also here. So how would you start, you know, um, knowing that it is going to be a very steep slope with wind in your hair and, you know, I don't know, you're, you're, I'm pushing a boulder, I think you got that right. Uh, you know, how, how do we get the next generation who's really invested in this, particularly from perhaps communities who haven't been in boardrooms and haven't necessarily been um, part of that conversation to, to say, there's room for me here. What's needed here? I think that some of that is going to come from the younger generation, if I can put myself not in the younger generation anymore. But, <laughs> um, I think that is going to, I mean, there's just so much like energy and excitement and different ways of thinking. They think are going to break some of the models and the ways that we've been conceptualizing the sort of what to do. So people are sitting around like, well, what should we do? Well, how would you like? I think that some of those, I've been so energized by these conversations I have with, with, with students, with um, junior faculty, just about the ways in which they're really trying to um, think differently about this space. And they're doing it in a very engaged way. They're connecting with the community. They're, um, they're going out and meeting people. They're talking to people. They're expanding their network by harnessing technology to sort of reach broadly and to really sort of crowdsource and bring together things that I think are just going to be game changers that we're, we might be missing by sticking with our, our business as usual. We, um, we, this week, we just launched with another fellow, um, a youth mental health project down in Jackson, Mississippi, in a very underserved community in public schools. And the person who actually wrote the fundamental internal paper was a high school kid who interned at Get Well, who was taking a gap year before going to college. And we asked CC, we said, listen, we're going to figure this out, but we need you to really figure it out for us. And so she spent six months gathering um, like friends and colleagues and, and students that she had gone to uh, high school with and other schools in, in, in D.C. And her paper was the fundamental foundation for the service design you know, of this program. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think um, uh, they're so locked in to what they want the world to be. Um, they actually need help from us old heads um, to kind of unlock and create you know, some space for kind of their ideas to kind of come forward. Um, but I'm so energized and inspired by how clear they see a world that they want to create that we have not um, created for them just yet. So I think it's a good time to be wrapping around our young people, letting them fly because they have, they have what it takes. I agree. And I think, I mean, I, it's easier said than done, but I think you just start. I think you don't, um, you don't worry about failing because uh, I think so many, um, so many young people are sort of uh, so concerned about the world around them. And certainly social media has not helped that much at all. But um, to the degree that you can just uh, just start and start talking to people and you know the technology um, is an enabler and it just makes everything so much easier. Um, but I also think that you know you're looking at sort of two mission driven uh, companies and a mission driven uh, provider and um, that helps a lot uh, as you think about um, pushing that boulder up the hill uh, because it, it's not for the, you know, starting a company or starting a nonprofit or whatever it is, is not for the pain of heart. I mean, it is, it requires a lot of um, grit and perseverance and um, very often that shouldered alone. And I think, you know, to the degree that you can disassociate from, from a fear about what others may think and just continue to, to, to sort of follow what you believe is right, I think that can go a long way. We're also sitting in an academic institution, so I want to like sort of <laughs> make the pitch for, I think there's real value in having a set of fundamental sort of skills that you can learn from training that will provide an advantage for um, a younger generation to really sort of make incredible progress. And so 
you mentioned business school, real value there and understanding sort of like the business of healthcare. We sit next to communication school, thinking about, you know, one of the most powerful tools will be how you can communicate and share and exchange knowledge. We have an engineering school thinking about, you know, AI and um, all of the tools that will allow you to build, develop platforms to expand a network and reach further. Um, we have a school of medicine, a school of nursing, thinking about all the fundamentals of understanding. So I think there's real value in um, really sort of having this set of tools under your belt that will really help to catapult work that you can do by having a real focus on sort of training, having a discipline that you know, being able to be very data-driven um, to sort of see if you're making progress. So we are sitting at Penn, so it's worth saying that there are so many different ways to sort of build that knowledge base, but I think it's really important for being able to take the work and the ideas and translate them into a business and to something that's going to have impact. And well, and if I could put it in a plug for ADOS, I mean, that's precisely what you're trying to do with that. And I think that um, incubators or labs, whatever you may call it, can be incredible um, source of resources and support for really understanding all of the different um, uh, components of, of building something and, and then how you take it out into the world. One thing I would just push on is um, uh, healthcare is flooded with really interested, talented, smart people, and the ideas are amazing and some really elegant solutions. They're, they're not often enough matched with business models that are clear and sustainable. And I think that in particular for early stage companies, I mentioned this complexity of all these stakeholders and reimbursement and all. So I think for the entrepreneur, I would be urging them to um, hone and focus because you won't be able to tackle the 15 different stakeholder you know, um, interest in your initial go and probably not ever. you know. But so I think it's really important because uh, the business of healthcare, like it or not, is is uh, is a massive driver, and I think a lot of times I, I'm, I'm involved in an early stage uh, fund up in New England, and I see a lot of early stage healthcare IT um, ideas. And man, these solutions are so amazing! Like the talent and the they're elegant and they they work, but the business models are just unclear, and it's hard for these incredible entrepreneurs to get traction that's sustainable. And then the ideas go away. And then the world doesn't benefit from these amazing ideas. So I just would really, I guess, urge uh, a real focus and concentration as much on this amazing product as is on the model to make sure the product gets to market in a sustainable way. I think sometimes um, we spike on product and then we are soft on business model. And then these things actually uh, have a hard time making it. Yeah. And also operations. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, getting something into a clinic or getting yeah. providers to change their behavior or getting, even getting patients to change behavior is, um, is hard. really hard. Yeah. And so thinking about, yes, absolutely. Number one is the business model. Like, will someone pay you for this? Number two is, will anybody use it if you can get it paid for? Um, how do you talk to your employees about when you're going to make a shift, right? So we saw after the murder of Dr. Floyd, a lot of big companies <clears throat> and small companies alike basically say, if we're going to start leading with the EI and anti-racist sentiment, um, and now we're starting to see reports of moving back and kind of forgetting that awakening that we had. So how how do you uh, how do you wrestle with that, particularly when when we have these top employees who where, who have fallen in love with the mission and now we're kind of seeing this regression to business as usual. So for us, the, the most sustainable things that we have done at my company are when employees lead them. Um, and uh, we have a volunteer, something called Greater Good is kind of like our internal culture committee and it's led by employees and it's remarkable, I've been around for 18 years. We have a 501c3 called Get Involved Now. It's run by employee volunteers. It's amazing. And our DEI work um, for years, similarly, you know, um, I think the more that you empower and you fund, like, your teammates um, who to create the environment they actually want to live, work, and play in, 
you know, then it becomes sustainable. And so I guess like for us, um, the more that like meters just say something, the less it has a chance for it to be sustained. The more that our teammates uh, own and are empowered to drive it in the direction that they want to take it, with our support, not with our direction, we have seen things be sustained. And so I guess like that is how yeah, at our company, you know, we've seen um, this be a real sustained focus for our team and we're um, proud of them. They're doing an amazing job. Um, it has to be baked into how you measure success. And so if it's a core metric that you're going to either pay leaders based on or um, bonuses or other things, really sort of baking this in is not just a, a goal that we have a shared mission, but that how are we actually going to measure progress. And if we aren't, how are we going to shift other resources to allow us to meet these goals? So, you know, somewhat of a what's the carrot and the stick here, but really sort of baking in this is a core metric that we are going to evaluate ourselves on and will be tied into how we make allocations about resources, I think is really important. I agree. I think it, you know, as it relates to your employees too, we talked a little bit about the Best Buy example where the CEO there um, made measuring um, equity and DEI initiatives a core uh, aspect of, of compensation. Um, and the only way you got to full bonus and full compensation was by hitting those targets. I think um, I think that's a uh, an admirable and also um, meaningful way to do it that really can drive results uh, in a in a way that doesn't um, you know make it sort of something that that is seen as sort of antagonistic. You know, I, th I think there's the the quantitative the quantitative side of DE and I that is oftentimes measured by HR. I think, of course, is important. And then, to me, there's the B for belonging. And are you actually fostering an environment of belonging where people can be their full selves? Now, we all know that if everyone in this room is either in a school, in a company, in an organization where they can be their full selves. We're actually going to get the best work. Like that is like so obvious. So I actually think that there's both a a kind of quantitatively driven, HR driven, like what are the metrics? Who are you hiring? Who are you promoting? Who are you paying? And that needs to be as transparent as you possibly can make it to make sure that, that actually is running in the right direction. I do think in parallel, there's a more qualitative aspect of this belonging. And like whether or not like um, everybody in the company can feel like they honestly are bringing their full selves like to our community. Uh, is a really important thing. And so in our engagement surveys, that is, for me, uh, the most important metric that we're tracking. You know? Do you feel like you can be your full self here at GetWell? And, um, and if you can't, we better be paying attention to what department is not feeling that way and why is it going on and what's going and what's happening? Because I think it's a really important thing that the world is leaving behind. The e and stuff at some point will be easy. It's actually the belonging that will hold us back, I think, from the real change. So. It ties to actual performance too. I mean, if you if you feel like you belong, you feel like you can bring your whole self, you're going to show up and and work harder and better than if. The... So, uh, health equity is not the same as health equality, <clears throat> and in the health equity paradigm, sometimes you have to reshuffle the cards and say this group is doing okay. I'm going to reallocate resources to this other group. And at times, that can be a very difficult conversation to have with stakeholders. Um, how do you navigate that tension of uh, we're going to we're going to put pause on this group because they they're meeting the mark, the criteria for health is being met, and we're going to reallocate resources to a different segment of the population. It sounds. It sounds obvious, but when you start putting dollars next to it, it, it becomes more complicated. So I just want to kind of get your thoughts on that real tension between a health, health equity driven set of decisions in light of, wait, but the majority of the revenue is coming from this, the, the group that's doing really well. Um, so how, how do you wrestle with that? With, to a certain degree, if like you're able to take resources from one group that's generating a lot of revenue and, um, uh, it's it's actually a way to fund that part of the business 
And that can feel good um, because you may see that as a market that you or a customer or whatever that you wouldn't otherwise be able to take on um, because they couldn't generate the, um, you know, they couldn't afford it or whatever. So to me, it seems like, you know, that's a win. Um, you can celebrate that, that we get to do this work because we have the luxury of doing that work because this other aspect of it will help afford it. Even if the revenue goes down potentially? Well, it's like Michael's example. I mean, that's a great example, right? We're um, going into that, um, going after sort of underserved or lower revenue, revenue generating impacted your margins. Um, probably means that you may take some short-term hits, but long-term you're driving, you're bringing more value. And so that's a good investment. Brandon right, was alluding from the beginning, right? Like we're too short-term and we're taking yeah. out that's right. some of these, yeah. these right. pieces. Um, we talk a lot about values and leadership. They don't know that I'm going to ask them this question. Uh, <laughs> what are your top three values when you think of your, your leadership style as it relates to health equity and, and entrepreneurship? Like, what's your what's your north star? Stars. I think for me, it's um, transparency. Really clear on uh, sort of uh, what the mission is, what the goals are, how people are being evaluated, where we're headed, communication. That is from Tony. Um, but sort of how to be I think, a really effective communicator, whether you have all of the information or not. This is something we're working on right now within my office, but like just frequent communication. Um, and then I think you want to Three, right? <laughs> Communication space. and data. <laughs> data. I mean, it just being a very data driven leader, I think, allows you to um, be clear on the decisions that you make that you're doing in a very equitable way, that you can uh, sort of always sort of use data to make sure that you're making sort of the right trade offs and decisions and that there's some, some equity and fairness in the process. So I really rely on the data really try to sharpen my communication skills so that I'm clear. And then I also, I think transparency is something that um, allows you as a leader to, uh, for people to get a sense of where you're headed, where, where an organization is focused. Earlier this morning, I was uh, in DC and we were kicking off our annual, um, uh, we call it LDIs, it's Leadership Development Initiative with uh, 18 folks in the company who are chosen according to these values. So on the value side, and I was kicking them off with these values. So if our values are part of our recruiting, they're on our walls, they are part of our annual reviews, they are part of all the things that we actually do, and they're really straightforward. Is number one is root for each other. Because in healthcare and health equity, this is a team sport. I mean, it is, uh, if we're not rooting for each other, we cannot succeed. It doesn't mean agree all the time. We have big egos and big brains and lots of experience in the shop, if you will. And we have nurses and physicians and software folks and what have you. But if you don't root for each other, we can't win. The second one is uh, share openly and honestly, because the world's moving so fast that if we have made a mistake, we should share it so we don't make it again. If we found a win, we better share it because we got to move quickly in that direction. And if we don't share openly and honestly, we just can't go fast enough. The third one is be world class every day. We're a relatively small company compared to places like University of Pennsylvania or Kaiser Permanente, where we actually do our work. So we work in the VA, we work with multi-billion dollar organizations who are kind of saying, we're signing what contract with who <laughs> to help on health equity? And so we have to really understand um, the magnitude of the importance of the work and the accountability we actually have and work accordingly. And then fourth is to find strength in our differences. And these are values, these four values are literally how our company filters um, most of the kind of key things we do around people at the organization. Um, and they're fairly unrelenting. We wouldn't take a new investor if we actually thought that they weren't uh, aligned there, even so, you know. And so I guess that's, for ours, it's very deliberate and very um, on the walls, if you will, because we think it's really important. Um, so my North Star, one of the North Stars, I think, of, of our company is uh, authenticity. Don't be something that, someone that you're not. Um, you know, I think you're in this room because of who you are. And uh, so that's that's number one. 
Um, number two is along the lines of be your whole self, but it really comes down to vulnerability. Like this is a safe, your work is actually a safe place for you to be your whole self. Um, and I want to make sure that, uh, that everyone feels comfortable doing that. I try really hard, um, especially in, uh, in all team meetings to talk about things that I've screwed up or things that aren't going right or needing to, um, leave early to take my kid to the doctor because I think it's important for people to understand that that that's you know that's okay and it's expected especially now in this world where um we are uh you know we're working from home we don't have uh you know it's just work and life has sort of melded together in ways that um that it just wasn't in years past and I think that um that as leaders, we have to show people that, um, you know, while we expect a lot of you, we also understand that you have a life and a family at home outside of uh, outside of the office. And um, and then, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, there's this um, deep respect for each other that comes with all of that. And I would say that's another fundamental value. Um, what what we're doing is really hard, right? We are creating this category of um, cognitive health in a primary care setting that really doesn't exist today. And let's be humble about the fact that this is hard and understand that um, we're going to make mistakes and we can argue about the ways that one may, person may think is right, uh, you know, is the right way to go about something and another may vehemently disagree. Uh, but at the end of the day, we have to be respectful of each other. So I think it really comes down to, I mean, we have all the metrics around um, about performance and, and, you know, customers and everything else. But I think at the end of the day, it comes down to human behavior and how we how we show up and how we treat each other. Okay, I know as panelists, we're not supposed to ask you a question, but you've been really singular in your in your leadership and the way in which you've been a trailblazer and creating new programs and um, sort of inspiring people at, in multiple stages in their career and life. And so if we can make a slight detour, I'd love to hear your thoughts on those three as well, because I think it's pretty awesome. <laughs> it's not how we play this game. Um, uh, but I, I, I resonate a lot with the, the values that have been shared. I think authenticity to me is really important. Um, passion. Um, I every day I, I feel the same. Like there's a steep slope <clears throat> that we're, you know, the social mission is not an easy one to just convince people or to make structural change. In. But I get really excited by um, the work that I do. I get really excited by the people that I serve um, and my friends, right? I mean, I, I feel like that there is something about, even if you don't work in the same place, having a community that you go to and you say, I'm really struggling today on how to, talk to this client or how to take this idea into a research proposal or what I wrote in the proposal isn't necessarily what the community wants. And so how do I, how do I navigate that? So, so those are, are two for me. And I think the third that um, I, I always forget, but it's, it's uh, often reminded, in fact, Tony reminded me uh, of it yesterday is that there's always tomorrow. And that you don't have to just kind of shoulder everything on a given day. That as a leader, it's okay to just say, I'm going to put this down today and tomorrow I'll pick it up, or maybe it'll be two days after that, right? Um, I don't think that we give in, in that kindness to each other often enough, uh, or we don't communicate it as frequently, I think, as we should, because I think the pandemic has forced us to kind of be always on, right? Um, I'm on my phone, I'm on my computer, I'm on my phone and my computer. The other day, I was <laughs> two meetings at the same time. And I was like, how is this, I mean, how is this humanly possible? While, you know, Eleanor in my office was talking at my door, and I was like, I'm in three places at once. This is pretty neat. Um, so, so those to me are some of the, the, the opportunities and the, and the values, but they, they come with challenges, right? Of uh, not dropping anything, taking self care and all this. I, I appreciate, Ellie, the, the note on the humanistic approach to, to the work that we do. But if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of other people, as RuPaul would say. Um, <laughs> So we've been talking about, you know, helping people at the patient level, at the you know, bedside, um, 
clinic level, but I want to kind of start scaling into the population health level. Um, and so we started thinking about urban rural communities and the disparities and inequities that are, that are faced um, environments. We can think about the life course, different age groups, gender, sexuality, um, race, ethnicity. What are your thoughts on how do we take something that is working really well in one sector and we're like, we found something here um, and how do we scale fast and, and, and or should we be scaling fast to think about translation dissemination to other communities? Is there such a thing as being able to say, this worked here and let me just go ahead and build, build fast and, and implement in a rapid fashion? I, I, I was just gonna say, I mean, odds are it's not gonna work well. And so you have to go there and and try it. And so, you know, I mean, um, people in a rural environment uh, versus an urban environment are just not gonna use the technology in the same way. Um, and our experience has been that when you just try to take something that's working in one setting and apply it without thinking through how that population may use it, where they will use it, you know, what the cultural context is, um, that it's it's gonna fail. You have to go there and and pilot it and test it and do rapid iterations of um, of whatever the product is. Uh, have a team on the ground. So when we, you know, we go somewhere, we'll take uh, an engineer and a designer and and uh, be in the clinic with with people so that we can see how patients are using uh, the technology, whatever, and then adopt from there. In my um, new role in transformation, I'm tasked with scaling across multiple entities. Um, and uh, some hospitals are both the downtown hospitals and the rural, the regional hospitals, and the the cultures, the issues, they're so different. And so, even our mental health platform, which was developed by our innovation center, sort of finding ways to to translate that to make it relevant for these different entities requires you have to talk to people, you have to understand what the issues are, you have to figure out how to reach different patient populations. And so haven't been able to sort of quite take something and um, sort of plop it in another area and it just works, but it's really all of that, you know, as you were describing the rapid iteration, the testing, the talking to people, the engaging communities, understanding the issues and not just making the assumption that it's going to work there because it worked in this other, other location. So that's something I try to think a lot about, about being really intentional about really sort of understanding a culture and what matters to people to develop the right solution. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that um, there's a concept we talk about a lot that we call digital intimacy. And I think that um, uh, when you try to scale these things out, um, if you just blindly think that because everyone has SMS or text, so all of a sudden it's going to relate the same <laughs> to multiple populations in rural and urban settings and all, it just simply doesn't work. Um, and so, but I do think uh, there are ways to combine, again, uh, high tech with high touch and to make sure that as you're working in new environments, um, you better include the stakeholders uh, that you're claiming you're going to impact. Uh, because if you're sitting in DC writing software, thinking that we're going to relate to the people in rural Georgia as part of a, extended MUSC health system now, um, it's not actually going to work well. And so, um, but I do think that what we're finding is possible, like digital intimacy at scale, I think is key to get these technologies to, to be able to roll out. Um, but you've got to combine high touch with high tech because the tech alone is a little bit too blunt um, to do it in healthcare. That's what we're, what we're finding in our data. Thanks. I just wanted to make sure that we, as we're talking about building things, that we weren't forgetting that there's a lot of community engagement and on the ground work that has to happen, right? These digital bridges, um, I touch. Um, I might have a little time, but uh, we've, been, we've been kind of dreaming together and thinking of some of the challenges and opportunities. What are some of the um, <clears throat> business models, partnerships, coalitions? Think of the configuration of, of different stakeholders coming together that you think would need more attention, um, need more resources behind, um, 
or um, dreams around that space that perhaps, you know, you've been thinking at late at night, like, I wish we could to move the needle in health equity. What, what are those partnerships that we're missing, if at all? The, uh, so we're working on an initiative around um, uh, food is medicine right now at the company. And uh, so the White House has this big, you know, event. From this event kind of spurs some private foundations to pull together stakeholders that include health systems, large grocery chains, um, technology companies. And I think uh, they're complicated because, again, everyone has these different interests and all. But I actually do think when it comes to health equity that we're going to have to find a way to pull together um, unexpected collaborations. You know? And I think like we have to be have again the courage and the trust enough to pull together folks who are going to have some uh, as, at times conflicting incentives on how to address this. But I actually don't think it gets solved unless we bring together a multitude of complicated stakeholder relationships, you know? Um, and so in this case, it's early days, but you're talking about, you know, Instacart and Intermountain Health and Get Well Network. And then we're, we're literally, I mean, so you're talking about like really folks who would not normally be together working on something, but I think that's what it's gonna take to address um, health equity at scale. Um, and I think we'll see some early promise in that, but it really takes leadership and folks being okay to sacrifice and what would be good for them in order to kind of make the partnership work. And those things are hard, they're complicated, um, but I don't think it happens without those kind of collaborations. The multi-sector is really important. And, you know, there are companies that are so good at reaching customers and they have like really gotten good at sort of the technology piece and being able to communicate a message. And in healthcare, we often rely on oh, well, you got to call your doctor, or maybe you should send them a text message, or, um, oh, you have to make an appointment, oh, you can't get one for nine months. We just, like, there's so many barriers. It's so arcane the way that we've set up the system of how we communicate in healthcare that you can't get an answer, yet you can, on so many other, like, the business model just doesn't make sense that it actually works because it's so hard to actually get the service that we're, that we're trying to provide. And so there are, you know, like, businesses that have really perfected how to reach people, hard to reach people um, in ways that, you know, we just haven't been able to do. So I think these unexpected, I like that, this unexpected collaborations that we would have with retail, with marketing, with technology, with, um, you know, the community organization and people whose business model is really about connecting with people and engaging them around sort of a shared shared mission that would be the usual people at the table is where we're just going to have these incredible sort of uh, innovations I think are going to happen. Um, are there, uh, for lack of a better word, meta carrots? So just knowing, right, how do we get to the meta? How do we, because we know that people have such different priority settings, um, needs, revenue structures, to date, when you kind of think through these big ideas, are there are there particular things that you're like, oh, this is something, this is an incentive at the meta level across these different sectors that I think I could I could move the needle or get buy-in if I just have the appropriate resources to allocate to it. I think that's really hard. If we think about, I mean, first we have to define what is the meta. Um, you know, like there was a. Uh, and I'm going to probably get this wrong. You all probably know this better than I do. But there was a, a report that came out, I don't know, six weeks or so, talking about the impact of social media on teenage girls' mental health. Okay, so if the meta is um, improving teenage girls' mental health, then in theory, social media should somehow get involved to help with that. Um, I think you know, talk about pushing a boulder up a hill. How do you, how do you do that? So I think it's, um, you know, we have to, we have to, you know, these are some big challenges. I mean, in defining what the meta is and really sort of thinking about how can these multiple different stakeholders that all have, um, you know, different uh, 
incentives and responsibilities and um, shareholders and other things? How do you get them to care? I think it's a it's a really big challenge that I mean I'm I'm not sure how. Yeah, it's okay. If you don't have the answer. <laughs> don't have the answer. So kind of where where are you in that journey, right? Just to we talked a lot about how hard um, all of this is, and just to shed a little bit of like where I think there is uh, light. So you know these studies that people are studying empirically the healthiest and happiest places on Earth, and the combination of factors leading to that are relatively consistent. Nutrition, exercise, mindfulness, sleep, human connection. And I actually think that if you take a health equity lens to that, you know, how can you come into a community? How can you gather some multiple stakeholders, use some technology to actually do the outreach like to a community and find a way to offer a promise like of this model, you know? Um, in incremental steps, because the empirical data is telling us that you know when you combine those, well, then you have people who are um, healthier and happier and reaching their full potential. Now, I know it's easy to say on the stage; it's really hard to do, even three blocks from here. Um, but I would offer to like a set of emerging entrepreneurs who are in amazing places like Penn to really make sure that. Um, we don't think too small because the world doesn't need another Rita's water ice, although I love it. Um, uh, the world actually needs us to figure out how to unlock, you know, human potential intimately, but at scale. And I think we've seen some formulas of like what that is made up of. And we just need to find a way to bring um, stakeholders together and find a way to kind of drive it. So I'm kind of, uh, lifted by some of these studies because I'm like, yeah, that's a pretty good way to live. I'm going to live that way if I could, but I think we actually have some technologies that can really help, you know, drive that out at scale. I know it sounds up in the clouds, but I think it's a uh, some North stars that we should be aiming at. Yeah. I love the example of the five, and I think what, I mean, like health is at the center of those, so maybe the, the meta is Talking about health equity, not just sort of like equity, but health is that piece that really is so cross-cutting every business and something that impacts really everyone. And it's what we all sort of want to be happy. We also want to be healthy. Um, and you know, nutrition, sleep, those things are all tied in with sort of our, our health. So maybe that is kind of this this thing that brings us together in a way that the equity meta, but health equity is sort of like this narrows it maybe a little bit. So uh, we've been talking about future entrepreneurs. So um, what advice do you have for them? So we, we've talked about persistence. We've talked about start sweetly, right? Start small. What else should a young entrepreneur um, in Philadelphia be thinking about or DC or in San Francisco? Or Puerto Rico, one of the happiest places on earth, <laughs> according to those studies. I think it's what Michael said before. It's find people who will root for you. Get a group, you know, community around you who can, um, you know, help help you brainstorm, who can help you think through pitfalls and and um, and opportunities, and um, you know, sort of have your back as part of that. And if, if that community can also be um, a group of people that can help make introductions or whatever, then you know, that becomes extremely, extremely valuable. So I would say, you know, find your community of people that can help you. Yeah, I think you guys are part of an amazing network here and I would be um, imploring you um, to uh, leverage it and ask a million, um, million times I'd be asking for help. I uh, have a chance to be down at Georgetown quite often in some different, both at the medical school sometimes and these kind of conversations at the business school. And there are always a subset of students that are relentless in their follow-up. I mean, for months. <laughs> and we hired a lot of them. And 
Two of them now are entrepreneurs. One's running a global skincare company. I'm like, well, there's no doubt. Like, it didn't surprise me at all. So, so I think I just would really, people really want to help um, ambitious, engaged, energetic people trying to do good. Like I, there's almost nobody I wouldn't call for those, for those young people. So I would just, just in, encourage the courage to kind of ask professors and deans and friends and all to help because they really will. Because it's what fueled us as well, because we got so much help. We would never have accomplished what we have accomplished without all of the endless help that we continue to get. So I would just be really encouraging that. I think refining your, your toolkit, figuring out where you're going to have expertise and what the, the skills are that, that you're going to bring, um, and also sort of your community, but also having an, a mentor or somebody who um, you admire their path, you um, you know, can learn from the choices that they've made and who's willing to, to take the time and, and to spend with you. I've been in Penn for 15 years and I've had so many different mentors. I've stayed because of the community and the the um, the curiosity. And but really, I've had some amazing mentors who've just taken the time to, to spend with me to help me understand the pitfalls, as you said, the things that work, the things that don't. But I think finding that person who can invest in you and help sort of on that pathway is really important. Thank you. The conversation does not end. Um, you're in for a treat. So um, Dean Villanueva is going to be helping foster a conversation with uh, the audience. And for those of you in Zoom, I very much believe that if you can questions on a Q&A, our wonderful Kevin Schott is collecting those and will be coming around to do that. So. Kevin, I don't know, Kevin, you have some questions for me that you're going to bring up to me? I will. Yeah. Yep. So, um, first of all, thank you for a really stimulating uh, conversation. I'm just taking notes here, and I have a couple of things that I just want to summarize. And as we wait for questions, I think some further things that I want to, uh, to ask or to explore with you. Um, first of all, I mean, what I heard is, again, the importance of being mission-driven. Mission and so again, whether that's mission and finding out what your North Stars are that keep you moving and to keep you focused as you're climbing up the hill with the wind blowing through your head and people knocking you down. We all have that image here, very clear. So so thank you for that. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's really important. I think, Brina, thank you for situating us in the university here and for recognizing that we have such a wealth here. And it's not just in the individual schools, because I think what we have learned and what you have said throughout, it's not that we are, and I just have to brag, it's not that here at Penn Nursing, we are now for the eighth year, the number one school of nursing in the world. We are a great school because we're situated in a great university with a great health system. And it's the interdisciplinarity. It's when we have opportunities to work on a wicked problem that really brings out those results. And so any opportunity that we have to do that for cross-learning to attack issues, I think we were all amazed recently at the, the work that, that the university has done in climate change and coming together. I mean, the impact that we had at, at this important meeting was absolutely incredible. And I'm not gonna say that that was by accident, but it was, but it was, I mean, in some ways it was by accident. People were doing their individual work and when they came together, it's like, wow, what super impact we had. The important thing that I think you also uh, raised, uh, uh, Raina, was that there are real skills behind this. You talked about building a business model. You talked about communication. Um, and we've taken that very seriously at the School of Nursing because as everyone was trying to figure out you know, what is innovation in nursing and how do we move forward? We had to stop and think, what are the skills that are needed and what is our purpose for doing that? So we have taken that seriously. We have um, worked with a number of our faculty to get them up to speed with the generosity of our, of our healthcare system in the Center for Healthcare Innovation. People had those skills. We worked on developing those skills. We worked on courses to develop those skills. We have said that it belongs in every area of our of our education from undergrad moving forward and jose i don't know if you i'm going to give you a little plug if you want to talk about the summer institute because that's also a way that we're working on developing uh, skills across disciplines yeah so if you're going to be in philly in the summer um particularly the, the last week of june june 26th through june 30th uh the school will be hosting a community 
co-collaboration, co-creation summer institute. So um, we have an amazing set of faculty and uh, folks from the community and, and the business sector coming to teach uh, three interrelated threats. So threat one is health equity fundamentals. Uh, threat two is design thinking and human-centered design and design justice. And then entrepreneurship. So how do you bring those three things together? Knowing that it's not perfectly uh, puzzled together, there's a lot of um, forcing that we're having to do across disciplines, but giving enough tools so that uh, attendees of the Summer Institute can then go out into the world and start finding better paths and better connections. So um, if you want to know more, please let me know. I'm happy to, to share that. Well, I'm excited about the Institute because I think it reflects our North Star as a school. It certainly reflects the, uh, I'm, I'm looking at Nan Hodgson, who I know is leading one of those areas as well. Um, in the elder space really reflects again, the work that's that's important to us. You know, one of the things that I, I wondered about, and Rena, you talked about how data was one of your North Stars. I think you, uh, Michael, you talked about the importance of a business model. And, you know, what I, what I wonder about or worry about is I think there's another layer that we have to work on. Because my, one of the things that I think is a barrier to many changes that we want to make is policy. I mean, you talked about healthcare being such a mess, and a lot of that is driven by these policies that frankly need to need to go. So I'm I'm wondering if you could talk, any of you could talk about if you could change any healthcare policy that blocks uh, sort of the innovation space of what you're trying to do, what would that be? You talked about nutrition, for example. Um, I mean, I could think of I can think of scope of practice as one one that's on the top of my list. But what's an example of a policy that I think gets in the way of some of the innovation you're thinking about? I, for me, it's pretty fundamental. I think uh, we have been too back and forth on value-based care as a fundamental model. And if I were the czar, I would be, I would be mandating uh, value-based care. I, I think volume-based care is fundamentally a problem. And I would be literally uh, forcing through financial incentives, if you will, and or penalties to your point, I would be driving a value-based care because it will really drive the behavior to make people come together to make people healthier. Right. And, and I, so I guess that for me, fundamentally, like that, that is what I would be really pushing on. I think from a policy we've been to, let's lean into this, let's pull back, let's lean in, let's pull back. And I think it's been a very um, difficult thing to navigate and has not helped um, the progress that needs to be made. That would be Great. thank you. Anybody else? No, I mean, I would second that. I think you know, there's this goal of um, everyone being in a value based system by 2030, and hard to believe that we are going to achieve that. I think whatever um, you know, all the stakeholders can do to, to ensure that we get as close as possible is, is key. Right, thank you. Um, I think, you know, Jose, you mentioned the idea of you know, the, why policy change is so hard is because it means the reallocation of resources. Yeah. And there's folk that are, are I, I, can, I can name few that are just not willing to let that, <laughs> let that component go up. So I think that's really, really difficult. Um, you know, the whole issue of sustainability and uh, scale up of change is just something that's really difficult to be able to tackle. I think you all gave us some fabulous suggestions about how to do that. Um, specifically as it relates to uh, social justice and equity, I love the idea of evaluation metrics, recognizing that um, diversity, equity, and inclusion belonging does not belong in one person or one office, but everybody is responsible for that. And again, tying that to resource allocation is, is critically important. Um, the one question I want to ask, and it's one from the audience, is this whole issue of digital intimacy um, and bridges that we're talking about. Uh, we are here, Greenfield Lecture on Human Relations. Uh, so I think as we're thinking about more and more in, as we're going into the digital world and AI, where is human relations? And I hope it's not just building a bot that can be more, more empath empathic. Um, so where, where, do we, where do humans live in this technology? Any of you? I just have an anecdote to share. So we're working on a project in Central California, in very underserved um, uh, agrarian kind of communities, South Central California. And we were given a file with 800,000 people who had not been to see a primary care physician in over 18 months. 
And so we use AI to send out uh, nine and a half million texts, but those texts were actually augmented by 50,000 live chats and or phone calls and 414,000 people within 11 months got to see a primary care physician do this. So I think it goes back to like, I, I, again, I, I think that the tech is great but to keep leaning into it. And I think it'd be augmented with personal touches to keep humans. And by the way, those navigators, they live there. So when they call people and they're interjecting into the chat, they actually understand where the physicians are, what the communities are like, what the neighborhoods are like. So I think it's, I think it's this combination. So the tech can do a lot of it, but it can't do all of it. So I kind of think we can really find a mix of this in a really powerful way. And we're seeing this, I think. Okay. They have to be married, as you said, and we can't let the tech sort of run, run rogue or wild. But there's this great example. We're in a crisis right now in terms of burnout um, among our physicians, our nurses, our social workers, really all of our staff. It's just at an epic level right now, just a level of burnout um, after the, the pandemic and really affecting sort of our, our patient care. And one of the areas is with um, the messages that um, you can use to communicate with your with your care team can sometimes take hours for the provider to answer during the pajama time. So when they're when they're at home, and so we've been looking at what are the ways in which we could use some some uh, some AI for this. And this is an example from a, a vendor that just came in, but they basically took the messages that the provider wrote back sort of during their pajama time, and then they had the AI sort of write messages back as well. And then they had people independently coding them. What they found is that the AI responses were actually more empathetic, more accurate <laughs> than the ones that were generated by humans, which make you could say, oh, we should just let the AI run run wild. But in actuality, you could think about ways in which the AI can have a human then um, sort of add another layer, train the AI even more to make the messages more um, empathetic. And you could also connect that with a human who sees where are the areas where we really need somebody to call this person or we really need someone to schedule an appointment. So you you reduce the pajama time and the, the burnout from responding to the messages. Um, and then you find ways to sort of augment it, but still the human sort of interaction. Is. So that's, I think, an area that we're moving towards, which is just more of this hybrid and it's not one versus the other. We just let the AI you know, do patient care, but we, we find ways to both make it allow us to do more bedside time, have it be smarter by this human and, and AI connection. Great, thank you. I'll just make a shameless plug on digital bridges. So if you go to the School of Nursing website, the Greenfield talk from last year was exactly on why you're designing online if you're not thinking of the people on the ground. So um, it's a whole fun hour of me talking about uh, <laughs> these connections between how do we do behavior change thinking about where people live. So I encourage you to do that. Great. Thank you for that shameless plug. <laughs> um, a question from the audience. And again, if we're talking about policy changes, those are long-term solutions. But I think if we're talking about uh, individual uh, designs or issues or innovations, how would you guide investors through short-term losses on the way uh, to equity? longer haul, which we said we all needed to belong to. I mean, that's the part of the game, right? I mean, venture capitalists um, invest with the understanding that there are going to be a number of years when it's pre-revenue and and that's the role that they play. And I think, you know, as we start to understand um, some of the implications of the market that we're in right now. We're going to see a lot more of that. Um, I think it comes down to alignment um, between the investors, the board, the CEO, and the company in terms of what it is you're trying to achieve um, and ensuring for those entrepreneurs who are contemplating taking investment from anyone that, um, that, that the investors want what you want, um, which is, uh, in our case, to, to help um, uh, better treat and diagnose Alzheimer's disease, but to get real alignment around what that means and how hard it's going to be and how it's going to take a long time. 
Um, and, and I think if you can do that, then, um, and there's this understanding that we're all on this journey together, uh, then you can get through those times when you are looking at losses or looking at you know a few more years before you see revenue. I think without that, it's, it can be challenging. Great. Other comments? I just think that there's a tension for entrepreneurs when we're raising capital. That's the, the um, path you decide to go down where um, you always say that you're interviewing the investor as much as they're doing diligence on you. But I think that too often uh, our insecurities as entrepreneurs have us um, desperate to just find a way to get any kind of capital, you know, into the organization. And I think it kind of goes back to like surround yourself with people that will give you the confidence to make sure that you are doing the equal diligence with your investors as they're doing on you, because it does matter uh, who you raise capital from and what their intentions are and what their values are, because it will dictate um, strategy if it's actually not right. Um, and these things do take a long time to come to fruition. So there will be near-term losses to make ultimate gains and impact. And so I think that uh, we need to help each other find the confidence to make sure you lead with your values because um, uh, it's a much better world and it's a lot more fun when we actually do. I think this is a, a similar uh, question, not related to innovations, but again, a question from the, from the Zoom folk is how do we balance encouraging people to speak up with how slow institutional change can be? So I'm going to change that graphic from climbing up a mountain to moving up a big old, big old rock. And that wasn't a big institution. <laughs> well, well, I hear change is easy here. <laughs> <laughs> I think it goes back to this sort of North Star and sticking with the things that you're really passionate about and that matter. And that if if it's not, if the expectation isn't that things are going to change overnight, that you sort of, um, it's it's the marathon with, uh, it's not the sprint with, with health equity. There are a few things that I can think of that, oh, we just turned the switch and then all of a sudden, you know, we eliminated, we, we fixed disparities, we, you know, created an anti-racist culture, we, uh, you know, enabled social justice. Like it doesn't sort of happen that way. So I think people who are oriented in the space have kind of the long game in, in mind and that if there are opportunities for shorter wins, like take those, celebrate them. And, and it's, you know, sort of a, um, a path that requires like persistence, dedication, and like really um, digging in. And um, we're all part of this Aspen Health Innovators Fellowship, which you mentioned several times, but we spent a lot of time reading about um, sort of leaders and the path and for most of the readings, um, it's like a long game till they see their um, actual sort of fruition, but, but the payoff is like so worth it. And so, you know, like for those young, dedicated, excited people who want to change the world in this room, like this is like, just be in for the long game and like, just don't be relentless about it. Like don't stop in your pursuit of this area because it's not easy. And you go into it knowing that, just like keep driving in that direction with that like passion. I have, I have a brother who um, used to run one of your very revered sports teams here in uh, Philadelphia. And he wrote a book after his experience here in this amazing city. And one of the things he wrote about was uh, API, uh, assume positive intent. And I actually think that for entrepreneurs, because you're going to butt up against institutions who you're going to see them as, why are you giving me every reason in the world to make it hard for me to succeed? Mm -hmm. But um, they have good intent as well. Like they actually are, like they have values and they're actually trying to advance the world as well. And so I think if we don't assume positive intent, it's too easy to get frustrated so quickly and not stick with what you just said, because it will take a long time. But I think if we practice API, it gives us a chance to make sure that we're looking at someone else's lens and not just ours, because most people want to make the world better. It's just a really hard thing to do and it takes a long time. I think that's really helpful. And I think both of those are very good messages for, um, for the students uh, that are in the audience here as well uh, as on Zoom. 
Um, and I like the comments about, again, being very hopeful about what, what lies ahead, about our youth, about the ideas that they have, about the energy that they have. And I've had to uh, shift my uh, sort of mentoring uh, away because I'm just like, well, you can't do this because this is going to happen and you can't do this. And my intent was, I don't want to see you get hurt and I don't want to see you fall off a cliff. Um, but hey, what do I know? Uh, so go for it and I'll be there and, and I'll be there to pick you up after you fall off the cliff if that's what happens and, and we'll, we'll see what happens but uh, but again I think believing in the energy of our youth and the ideas that they have I think is an important role for all of us to play so unfortunately we are done or unfortunately we are done with this uh, portion of this uh, Greenfield event here and I want to, first of all, thank all of you uh, for attending. And certainly, let's give a hand to all of our panelists. Continued engagement. Rain, I know you're going to be engaged with the school, because you always are. Uh, to, we'll look forward to the engagement of the others uh, with you on the work that we're, be, we're able to do here. I also want to thank, again, the Greenfield Lecture for, again, this incredible contribution. This is not the only contribution that you've made to the university. Uh, the Greenfield Intercultural Center is, is one that I know is frequented by many of our students and is a fabulous respite. So, again, thank you for the contributions here, for the investment in the university, for the investment in our, in our school here. I hope you I hope you've seen the fruits of some of the of the investments that you have, and I hope that you are pleased uh, as this is just a purview as what as what is to come. I also want to thank um, and recognize again my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Jose Bauermeister, for his um, extraordinary leadership not only in the school but in places beyond. Uh, his work as the director of Ado's LGBTQ plus health initiative promises to uh, move the needle here and to think not just about the great ideas that we as researchers have, but again, to think about the scalability and sustainability of what we can do uh, to move the needle on health equity and also to work on several on underserved populations. And again, this will serve as a fabulous incubator to our youth and to others who have similar ideas about how we can be able to move forward. So I'm looking forward, Jose, to, um, to what is to come um, and to um, what you have accomplished already and to what I know is going to happen with you and your fabulous team here. So again, thank you all of you, all of us, all of you for joining us here today. Thank you to everybody on Zoom. And uh, again, thank you for being here with us again today. So for those of you that are here, uh, we have a party to go to. <laughs> so uh, those on Zoom, uh, do whatever you need to do to celebrate. So <laughs>